Hello everyone, my name is Mohit Saini and today I am going to present on the topic of electrical impedance tomography under my PHN 300 course, which is a lab based project under the supervision of Dr. Mayan Goswami. First of all, we start with understanding electrical impedance tomography. Uh, so, why it is important uh, to understand electrical impedance tomography where it is used? As everyone knows that imaging is important in medical sciences because it helps in detecting fractures, ruptures, tumors, etc. Uh, there are many available methods that are used to image various parts of the body uh, such as CT scans, X-rays, MRI and ultrasound. Electrical impedance tomography has an advantage over all these methods as it is non-invasive, it is low cost and it is time efficient method of imaging. EIT usually takes less than 10 minutes for imaging as compared to the other methods which can take up to 40 minutes for imaging a particular part of a body. EIT uses the basic concept of conductivity of biological tissues. Uh, the major disadvantage that EIT has over other methods is that it is under development. It has not matured that much yet. Now let us understand the electrical model of a biological cell. As you can see here, this is the electrical model of a biological cell as proposed by Webster. In this, there are various resistances and capacitances present. Let us look at them one by one. Here CM represents the capacitance of the cell membrane which is shown here in the yellow color. Similarly, RM is the, cap is the resistance of the cell membrane. RI is the resistance of the intracellular fluid present inside the cell and RE is the resistance of the extracellular fluid present outside the cell. When a low frequency current is passed through this cell, this CM will offer very high impedance and current will pass through the path where it will find low impedance that is the path of RE. Similarly, when a high frequency current will be passed, this circuit will be short circuited due to low impedance of CM and current will easily pass through the RM. Usually the value of RM is much higher than the value of RI and RE. So based on the measurements, we can find the conductivity of a cell. Now as per the previous discussion, we can conclude that the average conductivity of some tissues can vary for a variety of reasons. For example, in the case of lungs, conductivity depends on the volume of air they contain because air is poorly conductive. In case of muscles, the conductivity depends on the direction of muscle fibers, how they are aligned because if they are aligned in the transverse direction, then the conductivity will be lower and if they are aligned in the longitudinal direction, then conductivity of the muscle will be higher. So, if we want to differentiate between different types of tissues uh, present in the body, we can do that by measuring conductivities precisely. How can we measure conductivities of a tissue? As proposed in the electrical model of a cell, we can uh, measure the conductivity of a cell and tissue is nothing but a collection of many cells uh, joined together. So, then uh, in the EIT model, uh, the may, the one problem is that uh, the resolution is low as compared to other imaging methods and that is because the number of electrodes that we can use in electrical impedance tomography can add max p 256 that is why the, the resolution is low now let us look at the instrumentation and process that is followed in electrical impedance tomography in the setup that we are using, we are using 16 electrodes arranged in this fashion. As you can see here, in this fashion, the 16 electrodes have been arranged and we inject the current between any two electrodes and we measure the voltage between all other pairs of electrodes. And this process is repeated for all the pairs of electrodes possible. For example, initially we pass the current in the first and second electrode and measure the voltages across all other pairs of electrodes. Then we can move it to the other pair when such as we can pass the current through such two and three electrodes and we can measure the voltage across the all other pairs. And we can keep on repeating this process uh, for all the pairs of electrodes possible. Now let us look at the process of electrical impedance tomography. A low magnitude 
low frequency sinusoidal current is passed through the electrodes then voltage is measured these voltage measurements help in reconstructing the image of the object under consideration the current is applied to a pair of electrodes there are different ways in which a pair of electrodes can be chosen such as neighboring pattern opposite pattern cross pattern for example in neighboring pattern the current will be passed between the two adjacent electrodes in opposite pattern the current will be passed between the opposite electrodes and so on and so forth a saline solution is used uh, which helps in propagation of current easily and a projection is taken when current is flown through a pair of electrodes and voltage is measured between all other pairs there are two sets of readings uh, that we obtain one without the object that is known as homogeneous set of reading and other one is with the object placed inside the cavity and that is known as the inhomogeneous set of readings and both these sets are used to reconstruct the image using the reconstruction algorithms in the initial stage in estimating the conductivity and permittivity distribution inside an object under study is to create a forward model of electrodes and the circular container using finite element method here we generate a mesh of the object using the finite element analysis and this finite element method uh, this forward model which we have generated using the finite element method is solved assuming homogeneous conductivity and voltage values are calculated as you can see here the mesh becomes finer as we increase the number of circular things that we want in our setup then an inverse problem is solved to determine the conductivity distribution from the measured voltage values now we look at the two primary components of the eit problem that is forward and inverse problem now what forward problem deals with is we pass the current and we assume a conductivity and then we uh, measure the voltages there is a resulting electrical potential distribution resulting from the current that we have passed now the what inverse problem does is it measure the voltages and then uses those voltages to calculate the electrical resistivity of the object under study these two are the major problems in eit which we need to solve to finally get the resistivity or conductivity distribution inside the object that we are studying now we look at the inverse problem an algorithm is proposed to solve the inverse problem and that algorithm can be one step gauss newton method with tikhonov prior one step gauss newton method with moser prior one step gauss newton method with laplace filter prior one step gauss newton method with hyperparameter selection or total variation reconstruction there are two methods of image reconstruction one is known as the difference method and another is known as the absolute method in difference method the difference between the homogeneous and inhomogeneous set of reading is calculated to reconstruct the image in absolute method the inhomogeneous data is directly used to reconstruct the image using any of the five algorithms written here now we will use edors software for image reconstruction edors is a software that has many inbuilt functions that can be used to generate mesh to place objects at certain location to solve the forward problem and to finally solve the inverse problem for image reconstruction here as you can see we have generated a mesh and we have placed two triangular elements at these two locations now we will use edors software to first forward solve this model and then solve the inverse problem to give us the conductivity distribution for these two objects now here we look at the reconstruction results from the five algorithms that were proposed earlier uh, these are the results that we obtained for the two triangular elements that we have shown in the previous slide uh, these are the results for these five algorithms in the same order and as you can see the fifth algorithm that is total variation reconstruction uh, gives us the best result for this particular problem now we understand the mathematics behind the forward problem and how we can solve it numerically using finite element analysis and we can simulate model voltages by solving the forward problem 
and we can simulate the results without even using IDOS and then we can compare both the results. The object under study is first divided into several 2D subdomains in the form of triangles or tetrahedrons. This is nothing but meshing. The objective of the forward problem is to solve the basic differential equation which is written here. This is nothing but the Maxwell's equation written in a more fashion way. Uh, the simulated nodal voltages under an electrode gives the approximate value of the voltage measured at that electrode. The object to be imaged is denoted by omega as you can see here and u is the voltage distribution within the domain under test. So this thing here is nothing but the current density that we have written in a more fashion way where u is the voltage distribution within the domain and uh, this equation we have to solve on the object that we are studying. Now we look at the boundary conditions and electrode models. There are two boundary conditions which need to be taken into consideration while solving the forward problem of light. These are Dirichlet boundary condition and Neumann boundary condition. Now electrode models are a set of boundary conditions that need to be followed for a particular arrangement of current injection and electrode placement. There are two major electrode models that are used while solving a forward problem. One is the point electrode model. In this model, it is the electrodes are considered to be a single node. And in complete electrode model, electrodes are considered to be formed of three or more nodes. The boundary conditions that are written here, these are for the complete electrode model as it is more, it is more frequently used to solve the forward problem. Here we can see that the voltage on a particular electrode here L denotes the particular electrode and EL denotes the area under a particular electrode or under the LF electrode. So it accounts for the contact impedance that arises because of the layer that forms between the electrode and the object to which it is attached. So this term here where we have a ZL, this term accounts for the contact impedance that arises from the contact between the electrode and the object. And similarly, in the second boundary condition, we can see here that the integral of current density over the electrode is equal to the current that is passing through that electrode. And the third boundary condition tells us that there is no current uh, passing or leaving where there is no electrode present. The complete electrode model equations can be formulated in this form. A, B, C equal to I, C, where A is the global conductance or stiffness matrix, V, C is the vector of simulated voltages at finite element uh, model nodes, and I, C is the injected current vector. The current injection pattern can be adjacent or cross. Adjacent means that we inject the current uh, between the two adjacent electrodes, and cross pattern means that we inject the current uh, between the two opposite electrodes. So our goal is to find this global conductance or stiffness matrix and once we find that we can uh, simulate, uh, we can use this equation to solve the forward problem of EIT. Now we look at the finite element uh, method of FEM formulation of the forward problem. The nodal voltages are assumed as an interpolation function of the vertices or nodes. And the nodal voltages can be represented as a weighted function of values of vertices. As you can see here, if, if the mesh generated has triangular elements and each triangular element has three vertices, then at each node or vertices of that triangular element, we can approximate the nodal voltage according to these three equations, where u1, u2, u3 denotes the voltages at the three nodes and these are the intercollation functions of the coordinates of that node. The values of the weights AI and BI can be calculated using the Kramer's rule and using these values in the original intercollation function will give us the approximate value of the nodal voltages. A voltage at a particular element can be approximated by using this equation here. Now the potential of a linear 2D element can be expressed as this equation here where Ni is nothing but the interpolation function of the elements and Ui is the voltages that we have as Ui are the nodal voltages that we have seen in the previous slide. Now finally we look at the finite element implementation in the forward problem. The method of weighted residual is used to solve the differential equation of EIT. This is the basic differential equation that we need to solve. 
we assume an approximate solution ux for this uh, equation and when we put ux in this equation we assume it equal to be r where r is called the residual in this method of weighted residuals what we assume that uh, the weighted integral of all these residuals on the whole of the object under the study should be equal to zero and our objective is to find these weights which are denoted by w now the weight w is approximated as this expression where nj represents the intercorrelation function and bj represents the coefficient of weight function and d represents the dimension which is equal to 3 for a 2d element now our main purpose is to solve this differential equation here and using the rules of vector calculus and uh, the Gauss divergence theorem, we can finally reach to this differential equation written here. And we have to solve this integral equation that is written here, uh, where omega is the object under study, and this gamma is the boundary of that object. And this symbol here, V, is the outward normal direction to that object under consideration. Now, till now, we have considered that we have to solve this integral over the whole object. But this integral is performed over each element where we have k elements in total. Now, when we solve that integral for each element, as you can see here, then we get a set of linear equations. We get a set of 3 by 3 linear equations for a 2D element and there are total k elements. So, total number of equations that we have to solve are k into 3 into 3. So, this set of linear equations that we obtain that we need to solve and the main purpose is to get the stiffness matrix that is generated by SK here. Now, this SK is approximated to be this and then finally it is approximated to have this form ui dijk. Now, this sigma k which is the conductivity of a particular element is taken to be constant here. Now, after calculating the stiffness matrices for each individual elements, we can finally combine them to form the global stiffness matrix and we can finally formulate the forward problem in this fashion, where SD is the global stiffness matrix and U is the combined nodal voltages of all nodes and I is the current injection vector. So, that was our main goal to find, this, find that global stiffness matrix and that can be found using this method that we have discussed so far. So the conclusion that we can draw from this is that the global stiffness matrix that we have calculated that can be used to simulate the nodal voltages and this can be compared to the solution from the EDO software result for the forward problems E8. So these are the references that I have used in making of this presentation. So thank you.